to follow up on Pat, there'll be lots of light-related puns regarding uh, shining light and so on um, in, my, in my remarks. Um, so let me begin by first thanking the Institute for the very kind invitation. Um, it was very nice indeed. And um, from my perspective in particular, I think it's great to have this opportunity to address this topic in the Irish context now as you know, we enter into perhaps a period of nascency for, for solar in Ireland. Um, in the United States over the past five years, um, we have seen a tremendous kind of transition. Solar once was uh, certainly a very niche, uh, a niche element. I mean, one with a lot of potential, but ultimately uh, not a lot of uh, uh, on-the-ground deployment. To the point today where solar is now uh, the, the largest, uh, uh, the most rapidly growing form of new, uh, new installation. And one that is incredibly beginning to enter into an economically competitive envelope that uh, we didn't even imagine was possible even five years ago. Um, with that said, um, this transition towards a more solar-heavy uh, future in the States um, is already proving to be relatively complicated. There are some very specific uh, characteristics of our markets that are not necessarily relevant here. But in my remarks now, I'm going to provide you with some, uh, some context from, from the US perspective, which I think hopefully will seed, seed a discussion that we can, that we can all have uh, over the next, the next hour or so. Um, let me begin, though, by first emphasizing why solar is so important. So without doubt, it is the most important of our renewable energy pathways for the world. If we wish to decarbonize uh, the global energy system significantly, solar is going to uh, play a very, very important role. And uh, fortunately, it's a very large resource, so it's well capable of doing that from a technical perspective. Um, additionally, it's also a very well distributed uh, resource. So here's just a map of the, the global solar resource. And I, I, I won't emphasize my slides too much because I, uh, I know that it may be difficult to see them. But um, basically, the point is that there's lots of sun typically where there are lots of people on the planet, except in northern Europe, which is slightly ironic. But, um, but crucially, going forward, where demand growth for electricity in particular is centered, so Asia, uh, India, Africa, for example, these are regions that have excellent solar resources. And that's going to help these parts of the world transition uh, their energy systems in a more low carbon sense than, than has been possible uh, in, the, uh, in the more developed world. Um, now, uh, the one technical slide isn't very technical, but for any of you not particularly familiar with the technical aspects of solar, there are two flavors of solar energy. Uh, photovoltaics is the one that I'm sure most people are familiar with. So that's the panel. I should be, be more precise. Two forms of, two flavors of solar for electricity generation. Hot water is a separate issue. But for electricity generation, you have photovoltaics, and, and that's certainly one that's most common. 97% of global uh, systems are, are, are photovoltaic based. And, um, and that's one, by the way, that will be relevant in Ireland. The second option is what we call concentrated solar power. And CSP is, um, is different in the sense that uh, rather than a direct light to electricity pathway, it involves light to heat and then heat to electricity. Um, that's extremely advantageous, okay, because you can store the heat, which means that CSP represents a dispatchable renewable energy technology, which is uh, really what we'd love to have ultimately. Uh, the drawback, unfortunately, is that it doesn't work well where you've got clouds. So hence my comment that this is not relevant in Ireland. In fact, it's relevant only in a very, very small uh, set of regions in the world, the southwest of the United States, the Australian desert, North Africa, and a few places like that. Um, so coming back to my original point that we've seen this tremendous transition, this rapid growth in solar, <laughs> solar arriving at the big table. Um, you know, the numbers say it all, actually. This year, globally, we've installed about 60 gigawatts of new, uh, so this year, 2015, 60 gigawatts of uh, solar PV, and, and we're accelerating year on year. So this is the first year, actually, that we will install more solar globally than wind. And I think that's a, that's a point that's going to continue. Solar is really the kind of the global uh, renewable, ultimately. Um, a few points, though, that are important. Uh, deployment to date has been centered, or at least concentrated heavily in Europe. So Germany in particular was in the vanguard of solar deployment. 
they had a very strong support mechanism in place. Uh, that is now waning, of course. But what we're seeing is acceleration in three markets in particular, three important markets. So China, uh, of course, is important in every context. Um, Japan and the United States. And those three markets are going to be three very important vectors for long-term growth for solar. Um, in the United States, as I said, more than half of all the new generation installed last year was actually solar PV. And uh, we're going to continue to see that accelerating for, uh, for the time being. Now, uh, solar is different, solar PV is different than almost every other energy technology for one particular reason. Um, its technical efficiency at converting uh, light, in this instance, to, uh, to electricity, uh, does not scale with size of system. Okay, so one solar panel is just as technically efficient as a thousand solar panels in a utility scale facility. Uh, that's not true for almost any other energy technology, even concentrated solar power. In fact, it's certainly not true for concentrated solar power. And this is what's particularly interesting about PV. It means that we can deploy solar uh, PV at many different scales. So at residential rooftops, commercial rooftops, right up to large ground-mounted facilities. And this flexibility is, of course, to be welcomed, but it brings additional challenges in terms of designing the system, and particularly in terms of evolving a system that has been designed for central stations in order to fully accommodate this. And it's going to be quite complicated, actually, in many settings. We're already seeing that in the United States. Um, the U.S. is particularly uh, important in terms of exploring this space because we have deployment, large-scale deployment, at all of these scales. So last year, 60% of our capacity was deployed in very large ground-mounted facilities, many of them in the southwest desert. Uh, the balance, 40%, was deployed evenly between large rooftops, so factory rooftops and so on, and residential rooftops. And there is an interesting juxtaposition there because um, what you have is a small number of very large systems bringing a huge amount of capacity, but a huge number of very small systems bringing much more general awareness of the technology. Uh, in fact, this month we will have installed the one millionth solar facility, solar PV facility in the United States, and almost all of that are on residential rooftops. Now, making all of this possible, and this is not just in the U.S., but of course globally, has been, uh, has been a dramatic reduction in the cost of PV technology. Um, so, it, it's interesting even coming from, from the technical perspective, because this has actually altered entirely our perspective on what matters. Um, five or six years ago, focus for solar uh, research, uh, you know, the lion's share, was on the, the panels themselves, the, tech, the technology, the conversion technology. And the reason for that was that in terms of an overall systems economics, the panel was the most expensive part by a long shot. Um, today, the panel for a typical residential rooftop system in the United States make, makes up less than 20% of the system's cost. In fact, the labor component, how much you're paying the guy putting it on the roof, is now a much more important determinant of the system's economics. And this is actually turning a paradigm on its head somewhat. How do we go about altering our focus in research in terms of <coughs> developing a technology and a balance of system that allows us to, to move the economics in the right direction? Scale in Chinese manufacturing, basically, is what moved the, um, moved the, the needle with respect to the panel's costs. Okay? And wild competition and a whole host of other issues with respect to trade subsidies and, uh, and so on, which are, uh, which are contentious and complicated. But nevertheless, the Chinese uh, cost reduction has done us all a favor because now we have a much, much lower cost uh, technology out there. But now going forward, we're going to face the challenge of how to move the balance of system costs lower. And as I said, that's going to involve reducing costs of racking and on wiring and all sorts of things. Um, but more importantly, it's going to involve reducing the cost of actual kind of soft labor, financing, and so on. And all of this now must be brought together effectively if we're going to continue the cost reductions that we've seen. So quickly on solar's competitiveness today, just a snapshot. So in the United States today, um, a utility can go out to the market and can have a, uh, issue an RFP for some solar power at large scale. And a, the developers that we have in the US market, at least today, will come back and they will tell you, we can sell you solar power 
for $40 per megawatt hour, four cents per kilowatt hour, or less. Okay, that's what they can deliver. Now that is net of some subsidy, certainly, um, but uh, only five or six years ago that would have been much closer to $200 per megawatt hour. And uh, that's what's really moving the needle, okay? Uh, this past month, construction has begun, begun on the first merchant solar facility in the United States. So a plant that is now being built which will compete in the local wholesale market in Texas without the assurance of any backstops. No feed-in tariffs and so on. Certainly there are a few subsidies that they're taking advantage of. But uh, what is most interesting is that the financiers in particular now view solar as a vector for growing power generation in a much more kind of standard sense. It's now part of the wholesale market and can be competitive uh, without, without long-term guarantees. <coughs> I won't belabor this, but uh, really uh, all I'm trying to do here is illustrate how um, <clears throat> what we call the levelized cost of electricity from solar looks uh, compared to some alternatives, and that's gas in the United States. And the message really is that in certain parts of the U.S. today, so the southwest, in Texas, anywhere in the south where we have an excellent solar resource, ground-mounted systems are beginning to be competitive with more traditional assets some of them even without any subsidy, right? And that's a very, very important. Um, by contrast, and this is just to demonstrate the complexity of the kind of the solar space and why scale matters, um, rooftop systems uh, or systems that are installed in regions like Massachusetts, where I'm from, where our solar resource is significantly inferior, uh, are much more expensive. And this then leads to a complex discussion that must be had. Um, you can have very cheap solar from uh, large facilities in the desert, but that's a long way away. It has significant environmental impacts, certainly, um, and a whole host of other issues. Or you can have rooftop solar, which is near to the demand uh, and, and, and provides a flexibility and so on, but it doesn't have the scale you need to really move the needle in terms of targets, for example. Um, this is going to play out, but it's complex. And this complexity, the fact that that's jumping around a lot, means that Developing a regulatory paradigm, developing a subsidy paradigm that, that's fit for purpose is also complicated and needs to be quite bespoke. Now, uh, briefly on some challenges ahead, and there are some real challenges. Um, and in the US context, and this isn't a context that's relevant everywhere, but in the US context, this graphic here actually illustrates probably one of the most important challenges, certainly for large-scale solar. So today, and in the previous slide, I just mentioned that solar is becoming increasingly competitive. Might even be competitive without subsidy. Um, but that is at what we call the margin. So on our, uh, in our wholesale power markets, for example, when solar is just providing a little bit of power on the market, at zero marginal cost, I might add, the clearing price for many of our markets, the Texas market, for example, will be high enough such that that solar asset is going to be able to pay for itself quite happily. But what happens when we begin to move enough solar onto the system uh, to matter, right? To matter if you're worried about climate change. Well, in our paradigm where we have wholesale markets, what happens is that solar begins to produce a lot of power right in the middle of the day, obviously enough, if you don't have storage. And right in the middle of the day, by the way, happens to be when our power prices are highest today, because demand is highest in most of our daytime peaking systems. Um, but suddenly you have a lot of solar, which is zero marginal cost. So that means you don't need to run your more expensive peaking unit or your gas turbine, which is setting a higher marginal price. You begin to actually depress the overall price, so power becomes cheaper for everybody. That's why that red line begins to fall as the penetration of solar increases. It falls marginally because, of course, your solar plants only generate during the middle of the day. But for solar asset owners, the price really collapses. So today, as a solar asset owner on a system, I get this premium product. I'm delivering a premium product because my solar farm generates power when demand is highest and when prices are highest. But if everybody's just delivering solar power and it has a zero marginal price, with today's market structures, the price collapses, and I'm no longer achieving the rents I need in order to pay for my plant. So there's a negative feedback effect that's potentially possible with this in terms, of, in terms of incentivizing deployment. We're going to have to contend with this. There are two ways to do that. One is to bring storage to the table, 
And once you have storage, you can actually move that power around the system, with storage costs. Um, and in addition, we might have to rethink our market structures quite significantly because um, the reduction in the, in, in the wholesale price that takes place during this period, it doesn't just impact you, the solar asset owner, it also impacts other asset owners. And in doing that, you're reducing reliability on the system in certain instances. It's impacting the equity value of many of the other players and so on. Now, this is a simulation. The real Texas system today, just moving more, more, uh, more solar onto it. But this has happened in Germany, okay? This has really happened, this exact dynamic. Um, basically, in Germany, uh, 2006, 2007, 10 years ago, they had a very peaky wholesale uh, power price. Middle of the day, demand was relatively high. That's when their utilities were running more expensive units. That's when they were paying down the capital on those systems and so on. The Germans introduced significant volumes of PV since then, and every year that has actually pushed down that average margin, uh, that average price during the middle of the day, and that has been causing significant challenges for uh, for many of the utilities. Now, whether or not you want to feel feel um, whether or not you wish to feel uh, sympathy for the um, my apologies, I'm sure what's happening there for the utilities, that's entirely separate. But the fact that we can't keep units on is an issue. Uh, you see, for example, in the States, actually, wind is causing this dynamic in certain regions. It's actually shutting down some of our nuclear facilities. Now, again, nuclear is a complex topic, but that's zero carbon generation that we're losing to the system now. So it's quite a complex setup. The German feed-in tariff meant that there was no feedback on this dynamic until they reduced it. Um, we don't have that paradigm in the States, so we're looking at this issue as perhaps a throttling effect that we're going to have to deal with for deployment of solar in many of our markets. Now, um, very briefly, just to speak about how we deal with this. Well, ultimately, uh, we deal with this with technology. <laughs> That's very helpful. Um, we'll deal with this with technology. Uh, what we need to do is we need to innovate, and we're doing that at MIT and many, many places around the world, looking to actually develop solar systems that can be deployed at much lower cost than even today's low costs. And, and in doing so, then you can continue to compete even in these markets. Um, there are real options available for doing that. Thin film technologies are going to be particularly important. They provide a flexible film that can be manufactured in a very high throughput roll-to-roll -roll framework that makes it extremely cheap. Uh, you don't need the high temperature, high pr uh, low vacuum settings that are needed for crystalline technologies. You can make them from abundant materials, which is crucial, at scale. Um, but today they're immature. It's going to take a long time to bring them to the market. So we're going to have to work with what we have, which is quite good, for the next decade or longer um, before we get to this new, this new technical paradigm. And so my final section before, uh, before I sit down, a little bit on the solar business model and subsidy structures. So low cost, that's been crucial. A good resource has been crucial. Um, societal demand for solar, interestingly, has been increasingly important in the US broadly. Now, one reason that it has been increasingly important is that um, there has been some innovative business model development on the residential side, which has meant that more people are actually seeing solar panels on their neighbor's roofs and deciding, I would also like a solar panel because he's quite sensible, so that must be a good idea. And, and these business models have enabled that. And they've enabled that by lowering the cost of uh, acquisition, by helping, helping um, make the subsidy monetization more straightforward and, and so on. It has, however, led to some challenges, uh, and in particular today, in the residential market in the States, we don't have enough competition and we don't have enough information. So people are actually paying too much for their residential solar systems. Um, there's a concept known as value pricing. Today, our residential solar installers value price their, their systems. They sell you a system relative to what the ESP equivalent will offer you power for. And, uh, and people, as it turns out, from a, from a behavioral economics perspective, like about a 15% discount. If it's 15% cheaper, I'll have it. Seems to work. And, uh, and of course, the installers have figured this out. And um, they price at about that level, even if they're able to take a lot more cost out. That cost is for them, and that's great. But ultimately, we would like to see more, more, more information in consumers' hands so that they could actually push down their energy costs even further. 
By doing that, that would help in terms of supporting the deployment of things like batteries, which are ultimately going to be required. Um, Eamon mentioned the German context. Germany has much lower residential costs than we have in the States today. And part of that is because the German uh, market, consumer market, is much more aware of what it actually costs to put a system on the, on the roof. By contrast, our utility space is extremely competitive, really good. And we have seen uh, that the way we've structured our subsidy uh, doesn't incentivize kind of holding prices up. It actually helps, helps drive, drive the, the competition among developers. And that competition among developers has meant that we, we're now approaching a, a situation where utility scale solar facilities are being, being contracted at about $1.25 per watt. Really, really very attractive numbers. So finally, to that point of, of subsidy. So Ireland is now entering into, through the white paper uh, and, and so on, clearly a consultative process at least with respect to how to support solar or how to, uh, to bring solar to the market. Um, we have had many experiments in the States at various levels of government with respect to this, um, and many cautionary tales can be told. First, let's talk about our federal level. So we have a federal investment tax credit for solar, uh, we have a federal production tax credit for wind. Uh, so why does that matter? Well, an investment tax credit does exactly what it says on the tin. It provides you with a tax credit based on the cost of the system. With solar, different places, different system scales, very different costs for the system, even though that system produces exactly the same low carbon product. And uh, what that means ultimately is that today, dependent on where you are, uh, and dependent on the type of system you have, uh, you will be receiving anything from you know, 30 or 40 dollars per megawatt hour to more than 100 dollars per megawatt hour of subsidy for exactly the same megawatt hour of low carbon energy. And that's a silly system. So the United States really ought to transition to federal subsidies that at least incentivize generation, so production, because that's what matters if you're worried about carbon. Uh, we're not going to do that, though. We have extended this uh, subsidy paradigm till 2021, and then it will expire. But at that, point, uh, at that point, we'll probably be good enough for solar to win, even without subsidy. Nevertheless, I think it's worthy of pointing out it is a silly and inefficient and expensive, and expensive system. Furthermore, the tax credit element means that it's not easily monetized for individuals and even for large solar developers, which requires us to go to what we call the tax equity market, which involves the big banks, giving you 70 cents for each dollar worth of credit uh, to monetize it, which means you're leaking taxpayer money directly into that private sector for no particular benefit from a solar perspective. Um, we have state-by-state -state level issues um, with respect to renewable targets, um, many of which are quite silly. Massachusetts, for example, has a solar-specific target in our renewable portfolio standard which requires the solar energy be generated in Massachusetts. The objective of our renewable portfolio target is, of course, to reduce carbon emissions. But requiring us to, to generate in Massachusetts um, is very expensive. It'd be quite simple for our, uh, and there are markets in place in the States, for our Massachusetts utilities to just contract with a facility in Arizona where you could get the exact same energy for half the price from the rate payer perspective. But the complexities of also wanting to be able to engender and develop and nurture a local solar industry and so on plays a role. And I think that's important to appreciate. The other big issue, perhaps the biggest issue of all, though, and my final, my final slide, is on what we call net metering. So in the United States uh, today, if I put a solar system on my roof, I will receive a credit uh, for every kilowatt hour it generates that is equivalent to my total rate for electricity that I pay the utility. Um, now, that's a big subsidy to me. Why is that a big subsidy to me? Because in reality, my bill per kilowatt hour from the utility is made up of half of it is, in my instance, half is for energy and half is for the wires. But by net metering and allowing, providing the energy that I produced with a rate that's double that, the utility is in fact paying me for using their wires. And it's a double whammy for the utility. They have lost the revenue from my use of the wires, and they're then paying me back to use the wire. This is very contentious now among the utilities in the United States because 
Many of them agreed to this 10 years ago. This was administratively very simple, and nobody had a rooftop solar system. Now we have a million rooftop solar systems, and that is eroding the revenue base for the utilities very considerably. And they have a legitimate uh, you know, issue here because that erosion is reducing the availability of uh, funds to fund the system. And if we don't change that, that's ultimately going to lead to a, a welfare transfer. And uh, poorer people, for example, who do not have solar systems on their roof, will have to pay higher rates to the utility. Um, we're beginning to see tr traction in terms of changes on a state-by-state -state basis because it's, this is a state-level issue. Um, and it's proving very, very controversial because it, it, it decimates, ultimately, the rooftop solar business, today's business model. So a lot of tensions, and uh, there's no clear, clear path forward yet. But we will contend with it, I'm sure, and some pathway will be carved uh, from there. So let me conclude by bringing in another pun and say that uh, the future of solar is very bright indeed. Um, but really, thoughtfulness on several fronts is needed uh, to ensure that this very significant potential can be realized. Uh, so first, a long-term uh, approach to technology development is crucial. So a lot of people are saying, well, look, the panels are very cheap now. So let's double down on getting, uh, getting guys faster, climbing ladders, and we've solved the balance of system problem. But this dynamic in the wholesale market and solar actually eroding its own competitiveness requires us to actually have lower cost technologies, significantly lower cost. So we need to continue that long-term effort to bring these new technologies to the market. We need to prepare the system for these new types of resources. So we have a system designed for centralized units, and uh, we might have a lot of centralized solar. It's somewhat intermittent, obviously, uh, but we're also going to have a lot of uh, uh, distributed solar. And we're going to have to prepare the system for that in terms of bringing storage in particular to bear on, on the system. And then finally, um, and this is perhaps important going forward uh, for Ireland, uh, subsidy and deployment support for solar development really needs to be developed very thoughtfully. And wherever possible, it should be designed to be as efficient and as dynamic as possible. So the solar industry, costs have moved very quickly. It's important that the support mechanisms can reflect that in order to kind of minimize any efficiencies that may exist. And uh, with that, I thank you all very much, and I look forward to the conversation.